Okay, guys, so do you want to start off by introducing uh, yourselves and each of your companies? Sure. Um, can you hear? Is that all right? Um, so my name's Albert Reinhardt. I'm from Fandor, and we have a on-demand subscription service that brings indie and world cinema to your fingertips or your living room TV. Uh, and we founded this company about three years ago as two of the other founders and I were lamenting the fact that we hadn't made it to the San Francisco International Film Festival because of small children and schedules and all of those things and realizing that, hey, if we don't catch the films here, there's a high likelihood we're gonna miss most of them because they won't get wider distribution. Um, some of them will be big. Some of them may get to the, uh, you know, be Academy Award winning or nominated for, but most of them will just disappear. Uh, and there really is a market for these films. So what we created was a subscription service that would allow uh, people to get exposed to films that they hadn't necessarily heard of, uh, rather than letting them go away. And one of the, sort of the the cornerstones of our service was finding a way to weave together both uh, you know, machine learning, uh, curatorial and editorial recommendations, and um, just uh, you know, the user behavior uh, to make smarter recommendations so that you could line up with films you hadn't heard of and at many levels within the service. So, um, we've got a agile engineering team that is working pretty consistently with a set schedule for the next month or two and you know, really sort of evolving the roadmap as we go along and allowing us to analyze and turn around all the great feedback we get from our users, both their uh, behavior on the site, the interviews we do with them, uh, the surveys we do of potential users. So all of that really is great to have and feedback into the business development that we're doing. Um, and uh, some of the exciting uh, stuff we have, you know, and, and one of the big challenges we have is just getting these films out to people because everyone has their own device that they want to watch on. You know, people want to watch on their iPhone, their iPad, their Android tablet, or you know, their Sony TV or Xbox. So a real challenge has been just trying to meet the demands of all those platforms. And they all have different uh, needs. You know, there's a big difference between designing for a 10-inch screen and a 10-foot screen. And, you know, what concessions do you have to make? So we've really enjoyed, you know, these challenges and working towards them. And it's, it's been super exciting just in the last month or so seeing things like Google uh, Chromecast come out where, you know, it's still in sort of alpha or beta as they're calling it, but it turns your phone or your tablet into the most powerful remote control ever. Uh, most powerful because it's so much easier to use than something with 50 buttons. You use it every day. Everyone pretty much has one. And all it does is tell this little HDMI dongle that you plug into your TV what to pull off the internet from our library or from Netflix's library. And it's great. It, it really supports the idea of having a second screen, not just for social experience, but for providing all this great context for these films that really gives you a better sense of what filmmakers intended, what a critic said, um, any of the supporting articles or videos we have. So you know, there's, there's just been a lot of uh, new developments really in the last three years that have helped give independent film um, a, a foothold where they had been losing out and give it a chance uh, to have a similar transformation that we saw with the music industry about five years ago. Uh, I'm Adam, and uh, by way of background, I'm an entrepreneur. I had a company straight out of school and built that, went profitable, sold that company a few years ago. I spent the next three or four years after that with the acquiring company. Revenues went up about 500% or so, up to about 180 million in the first two or three years. So it was good fun to see all that happen and have really a global experience. After that was done, I started PivotShare. And that is an online video platform. Um, but by way of sort of background for the audience here, hands up, who here has a cable subscription? Not that many. Who here buys DVDs on a regular basis? We got two. Awesome. Okay. So 
you know, that, that, that trend has been happening for a little while. And, you know, I'm, I, my first company was sold to a company in Southern California. I'm from Canada. And the big thing in, in, you know, in LA is video and Hollywood. And when you start to look at what happens from the person holding the camera all the way down to the person sitting in front of the screen, there's seven or eight major functions. And one of the things that you can see is every one of these is breaking down and changing. So as an opportunity for disruption, which is what I love to do, that was a great place to start. So on, on the surface, uh, our new company, PivotShare, it's a place where anyone can go and upload one video or a thousand videos, it doesn't really matter, it can be one or a collection. And then you can add a, a rental price, you can add a buy download price, you can have a monthly subscription, or it can be free with a tip jar. And you can really create your own experience. It's, we're not trying to create a marketplace for content, we're trying to empower people to create their own. And uh, deeper down into that, when you look at the steps actually happening from, from the camera to the screen, you know, there are things like marketing is changing, curation is changing, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that we do really well is the aggregation of content, which is really what uh, a cable conglomerate would normally do. And one of the ways we do that is we use, you know, big data and we leverage analytics to figure out what content is really worth. So one of the examples I give is, you know, if you look at Netflix, they go around town and they license content from everybody. They'll pay someone uh, half a million dollars, a hundred million dollars for a library of content. Um, but at the end of that relationship of the one or two years, someone either overpaid or underpaid for that content. So what we do is we actually have a system where everybody in this room could upload a single video to a channel called Hacking Arts, and we'll monitor how many times that video was played, how long that video was played back for, how many tweets, Facebook likes, et cetera, and we'll come up for that month how valuable your content really was, and then we pay out the appropriate amount so we can keep an, a fair and honest subscription price um, and it's kind of a, a democratic payoff schedule. And it also encourages people to have fresh content, new content, and to market content. Um, so we have some neat tricks that are, aren't public yet, but they're coming. Uh, uh, my name is Richard. When, when I started in independent film distribution in the mid-90s, people did still buy DVDs, which meant there was a whole lot of money um, to play with because DVDs had a huge profit margin. Um, so it was relatively easy um, to acquire a movie, put it out into the world, spend money against it to create awareness, and then have an audience show up and foster directors with that same sort of money support. Um, in 2002, I started, I had a friend that had a peer-to-peer -peer network called eDonkey2000, and he wanted a legitimate uh, way to use his software, a legal way to use his software. Uh, so he came to me and we started licensing movies and created an online uh, streaming and download platform, which was actually quite similar to Fandor. Um, we were curating American independent and world cinema content, but it was very dissimilar to Fandor because it was 2002 and it still took like 12 hours to download a movie. Um, so that was no fun. And, um, but the other thing I missed from it was the excitement and the community that exists in the theatrical space for movies. Um, go into the movie theater, seeing the movie in, on the big screen in all of its, uh, its glory, and then having people around you participate in the discussion. And so I went back into theatrical distribution, but it was a much different place by 2004. There was far less money and you saw the marketing efforts, the way that you were able to get the movie's message across and get people interested was much, much more grassroots. Um, you were trying to go into individual communities, find people, get them excited, find organizations and groups, and then, um, but you also had this whole set of digital tools. Um, but there's still a lot of clutter out there and to make the theatrical experience economically viable, you need a lot of people to show up. Um, so I now work at a company called Gather Films. And Gather essentially serves as a crowdsourcing mechanism for theatrical movie screenings. Uh, much like Kickstarter, if somebody wants to see a movie in our library, they can make a request, we set up a screening, but it comes with a threshold. So 
a certain number of people need to pre-reserve a ticket in order for the screening to happen. And if it does, great. And if it doesn't, it just disappears. Um, it's the biggest thing it's doing away with is that huge monetary factor of marketing. Um, the screenings are able to exist on their own within a community ecosystem. And on the filmmaker side, if they've spent time fostering a community over the two, three years they spent making the movie, they now can directly access them, but give them something tangible to do. You can set up a screening and you can get your friends and these other organizations to come and, and fill it. So it's, it's in conjunction with, with what both of these guys are doing. It's, it's part of the process of democratizing the, uh, the distribution process and making it much more audience driven than um, trying to force a message on the populace. So obviously, you guys are all coming from different places on why you, you know, got involved with the indie film business, because um, it seems that you guys are mostly working with independent films or independent content creators. What's the problem right now with the traditional method of distribution that we've had? You know, what are the, you know, taking it down to bare bones, what are problems that you guys personally said, I want to fix that? This doesn't work for me. It doesn't work in general. I want to fix that. Um, I can jump right in. So, uh, you know, one of the things we saw is just that uh, with Hollywood blockbusters, you know, uh, all the marketing was being put behind them. So Netflix would go out, pay up fronts for content, and leave a lot of things behind. Uh, and where we really tried to step in was. Um, similar to the uh, uh, system you described, we have a revenue share with the filmmakers that are associated with us. Whenever uh, people watch films, they get paid out of the subscriber pool. You know, it's it's you know every every ten dollars that someone pays a month for our service, five of that goes to the filmmakers, and that's split up both mainly by attention for every second watched because. We're tracking that. We know we know what's happening there, and then also just for inclusion in the greater library. So it really allows people to get, you know, have an ongoing source of revenue associated with this, so they can go out and make more films. Uh, and it's not exclusive either. It works, you know, with all of our systems. So uh, I got a more boring answer, but it, my first startup, I had no. It was in the. GPS mapping satellite space, and I had no idea what I was doing, and it worked out, but it was just pure luck and chance. So this time, I'm trying to take a more theoretical approach to things, and in particular, this problem here, there's two big changes happening, right? So the cost of content, traditional television content will cost you, depending on if reality TV is a lot lower, but generally produced content is like $100,000 a minute, and professional content on the internet is like $1,000 a minute. So the result is a lot more content. You have 100 hours of content uploaded to YouTube every minute. On the other side of the coin, you know, going way back, content only came out of ABC, NBC, CBS, whatever. Once cable happened, and then of course satellite after that, you had a few hundred channels. But you still had scarcity on distribution. Once the internet comes, you have unlimited. So it's not really that you know, there's a giant pain point. It's more that things are just shifting that you have to look at a world where you have unlimited content and unlimited distribution, and, and then problems like, well, how do you decide what you want to watch? And that's when either you have to curate it or the audience has to tell you. Um, so there's issues like that coming up, and that's just a lot of fun for us, and we think we have some cool solutions. Yeah. For, for us, we're trying to solve problems for a few different uh, parties. On everything these guys said about the audience, I mean, there's monetizing your, your film is so much harder today than it was um, before, and you need more outlets. You have to give people a delivery mechanism um, because, or they'll just move on to the next thousand pieces of content that are out there. Um, on the theater side, which is our other big client base, I always get these numbers wrong, but I think on average, 85% of the seats in theaters go unsold. Um, 
And I think from Monday through Thursday, which is primarily when we hold our screenings, it's, that number is something like 93%. So you have, they have to turn the lights on, they have to pay their employees, but the theaters are empty and everybody's losing money, you know? Um, so a lot of advances have happened over the last few years. Um, a huge portion of the theaters in the US and worldwide are now digitally, have digital projection systems. And that means a lot. It means that uh, delivery of content to the theaters is cheaper for both distributor and for theater, but it also means that they can change their programming with m much greater ease than they could before when you had big platters of uh, film reels that had to be spliced together and sit on the platter for a week at a time. But, so they have this programming flexibility, but they're not so sure what to do with it. Um, and so that's a, another solution is how can you show the demand? Um, we work with lots of companies like, like um, Fandor and, and PivotShare where not only are we, are we servicing this theatrical screening, but we inherently disappoint a vast number of our, our consumers because they come, they set up a screening, and it never tips. The threshold is never met. And so we'll have lots and lots of screenings for movies that we have to, the, the consumer leaves disappointed. We're able to turn around to those people because we're capturing that demand during theatrical when the most money and time and effort is being poured into marketing the film and say, we're so sorry your screening didn't tip, but you can still watch it right now. You can go see it on Fandor and here's a coupon to do so or you can buy the DVD right now and you get it for 60% off. That sort of information is invaluable for filmmakers and, and distributors because we're able to say you can do something with this interest and you can do it in a variety of ways. So it seems like a lot of what you guys are doing um, with all three companies is really finding a way to connect uh, particular audience with the content they actually want to see. If during the work, you know, the work week, 93% of theaters are sitting empty, that's probably not just because everybody's at work. It's because the theaters aren't showing something that people are actually going to show up to see. And obviously, there are specific genres. For example, um, American indies overseas don't make any money. On, uh, I, I read a quote about Cannes uh, 2012 where um, a producer who was uh, looking at distribution said that American indie coming of age type of films have literally zero chance of distribution overseas. And you have a similar thing where independent films from overseas, maybe unless they're horror films, will rarely get a play in the US. So you are looking at you know niche audiences but at the same time you know american indie uh coming of age stories you have films like short term 12 that are blowing up so there is certainly an audience for them um have you guys taken any steps um just are there any titles that you guys have seen like an actual ability to connect with your audience Um, that's a good question. I mean, we definitely have had great reception to a lot of our films, and surprisingly, um, some films that you know we didn't imagine would have great awareness. And a lot of it is just being able to um, one play off social media, and you know, people who are excited about something um, can get brought in off off of that. But then they get introduced to other things that may be related. Uh, you know, one film which. Um, I mean, this wasn't, it wasn't as wildly successful as we wanted, but you were involved with that, was Sleep Furiously, which we screened on Fandor, and we had a large number of people just come in because the soundtrack had been done by Aphex Twins, and you know, just all these people came in, exposed by that hook, who would otherwise normally not come to the service, and a lot of them stayed and you know, explored around and found other stuff to watch. So, I mean, that's where you know you're, you're meeting some success. We also partnered with the Welsh consulate on that movie. Yes, which was great. We we had a contest where you could win a trip to Wales. Yeah. Someone was happy. <laughs> I don't know if we ever gave that away. I thought about that. Um, okay, so um, I know we're kind of slow on time. I'll keep it super brief. Mm -hmm. But basically, the more niche the film, 
um, the more successful it's going to be on one of our platforms. So I can give three quick examples. One was uh, a film about American history where the guy actually recreated the Pony Express for the anniversary and went down. And almost every town he stopped and won a theatrical screening. And they filmed in like 14 places, funded by the Parks Association, et cetera. One was a film about mental health, which was marketed directly to the mental health associations in the country. And that did very well. And one of them was actually from the Cannes Film Festival of 2012. Uh, it was a Jeremy Irons film called Trashed, and it was an environmental uh, issue film, and marketed to those groups did very well. And th that's not the right film for a theater because the audience is spread out, but it was the right film for like a VOD approach. I have, I have two very quick examples because uh, the, our biggest success thus far is a movie that we released on March 7th, which was International Day of the Woman. And it was a film called Girl Rising, a uh, documentary about empowering girls in impoverished countries through education. But a very small title. Um, we've now, over the last six months, I think had 850 screenings across the country that have grossed $1.7 million, um, which are good numbers for independent films. I mean, $1.7 million is good for any in indie. But what's more remarkable is that's all from individual screenings. It's not from runs, meaning it's in the theater for a week. And what that means is um, the, the screens are full. You know, They're, I think that one was something like 85% sold out across those 850 screenings. Um, but that film, the filmmakers were also a charity. And they had three years of work behind them galvanizing women's groups all over the world but particularly in the US, from the UN all the way down to the Topeka you know, Junior League. And those groups were getting behind the film, setting up screenings, and filling screenings. But they also had a group of 10 people in New York you know, plugging away at this and contacting those groups every day. And so we look at it and we wonder, well, you know, how much work does it really take? We have another movie that just started called Anonymous People which answered that question for us. It's a small documentary, a great small documentary, um, about addiction. And in this case, it's just the one filmmaker. And I think we're at somewhere around $120,000 in box office right now. And that's just through his efforts and the, the virality he's, he's able to generate. And then what, what we're able to bring to the table in terms of creating the tools to allow that. But one thing that I think is really important, when I, when I talk about examples like that, and, and Adam mentioned, the more niche your movie, the easier it is to market. But that worries me, because I've, I've handled lots of music docs, or uh, conservation docs, or, or other issue-oriented things. And yeah, you can get your core audience behind that, and you can get them to show up. But how valuable is that? You know, I want people outside of that niche to be coming and experiencing the movies because those are the ones who are most likely to be affected by it. So what we're really focused on now is how to, how to start crossing over those audiences. And in a service like Fandor that has a great curatorial team, they're able to shepherd you, the user, through that process and, and make recommendations. And everything that we're doing now is, is trying to figure out how to make those transitions. Yeah. I think it's very complimentary, and and um, uh, you know, in in just how they can support these services can support each other, and yeah, Fandor because it's a subscription, you can try anything, um, and obviously we want to connect you up to something we know you'll love, uh, but you don't have that worry of oh, am I gonna am I gonna spend five dollars needlessly, so it's nice. Yeah, so you guys are all essentially, you know, using social media, using algorithms, using new technology to really put some life into a dinosaur that's uh, starting to go extinct. So that's, you know, it's fantastic that you guys are doing this and that you guys have been successful at it. I think it means a lot to the filmmaking community. So thank you guys for coming. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A. So if any of you guys have questions, we'll try to see over the lights. Yeah. Um, they can go to the microphones, yeah? Yep. Uh, I have a question about uh, content delivery. I, I know you all 
uh, deal with uh, large amounts of data. And um, do you feel any pressure by the ISPs? And, and, and on the same thing, uh, do you have you ever, I mean, just out of curiosity, have you ever felt any pressure by the large studios? So. Um, I, I can speak to that. Uh, we haven't felt any pressure by the large studios. They're generally, um, they, they, you know, uh, we're just a little gnat, I think, generally. Uh, but the ISPs, they haven't um, directly challenged the data we're trying to push through the pipe. But indirectly, it's a big interference um, dealing with people like Comcast and Western Digital and, and trying to get our traffic routed. And you know, companies like Netflix can afford to get you know, lots of engineers and IT staff working with the service providers to minimize the hops between all the stations. So, you know, I myself experienced, sorry, uh, an issue where my local cable delivery, I had great Netflix service. It was awesome. I could stream HD and Fandor just kept choking because Comcast was overcommitted using some sub company to route out. And so my hops were going all the way to Virginia and back. Mm. And I was getting lousy service. And there's nothing, I, there was no, way I, as a consumer, could go to Comcast and complain about it. Or do you and then, like a pay off or like a? Um, no, we've just been working really hard at our distributed infrastructure for movie delivery so we can minimize that. And, and building, building um, much, uh, many more tools to analyze and report on playback. We had a, uh, see a quick comment on that. We started with the same problems. And <clears throat> there's several companies that are going to help you with that like Akamai, Level 3, um, Edgecast, just traditional CDNs that will carry that traffic and they'll do a good job of getting it there. Hi, my name's Ken and thanks for sharing with us your insights. So it looks like in the past few years, the um, subscription model has really gained its traction um, in like the film business, especially after Netflix uh, launches subscription service. It's really kind of like exploded. Um, so, uh, but the problem with subscription model is like currently for videos, you only get the option to stream the movies. So actually I'm having the idea of you know, building a software that enable users to download those music, uh, these videos to your device. Also at the same time, protect the content after the subscription expires. So I just want to get feedback from you guys as far as the feasibility of this idea uh, from a distribution or uh, IP or legal kind of perspective, whether it's feasible. Sure, I mean, there's uh, ultraviolet from the Hollywood camps. It, they do that, it's kind of a, it's a DRM play. Mm -hmm. So you can, as a third party, you can go to like Adobe or something and get the Adobe, what are they called, it's now primetime DRM. Mm -hmm. And you can actually have that functionality today. The question becomes, you have to have some sort of a, it's a lot more expensive to package the content so the difference is if you're going to do a encrypted stream or something, you can just have it on a server and encrypt it on the fly. If you want to do a DRM base like that on the encoding process, you actually have to package the file a certain way, have it sit there, and it just it costs a lot more money to, to do that. But on a small number of uh, films, it, it's definitely doable. Okay. Yeah, and it, it also has to do with the comfort level of the filmmakers you work with. Some people, some people are fine with existing DRM solutions. Some. Some are not. Yeah, some really want that. Yeah. When I, st when I started online distribution over a decade ago, people would slam the door. I mean, literally, would get angry at me <clears throat> that I was pitching them to, to make their movie available for download. Um, and it's, everybody said, only 10 years ago, we, we as an industry will never let that happen. And mm -hmm. It does. My question is more basic. Um, it often happens that you hear about this movie and you want to watch it, and the movie is somewhere in the world where you have no access. How, is there some way on your sites to request such movies be screened? or Do you have any way to contact the filmmaker to get us that movie on? We don't currently, we don't currently accept demand for movies not in our library, but it's something that we talk about all the time, definitely, because getting access to the films, 
usually isn't that difficult. Um, we've been in, in the movie industry a long time, so it's relatively easy for us to reach out to whoever does own the content. And especially if we're able to show demand, then it makes it a lot easier for them to say yes. Um, it's not, they're not taking a risk. We've eliminated the monetary factor of, of that. We're just able to say, 50 people want to see this. You should let them see it. You know? Yeah, I think by asking that question, you're proving the demand for the film. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people will reach out. And the, the, the other answer, if it wasn't being filmed, I would tell you exactly how to do it. But there's a lot of <laughs> you know, proxy services you could use to access content in other countries. And you should look into them. Thank you. I have a question. I don't know if that's a conflict of interest. Um, so you said 10 years ago, people slammed the door in your face when you suggested downloads. What, what's going to happen in 10 years? What do you see happening in the future? <clears throat> um, you don't want that one? I don't want that one. <laughs> I think it was directed at you. Um, basically, Unfortunately, there, there's some disturbing trends from like a film lover perspective because it's all about, if you talk to a filmmaker, they want their stuff in 4K, they want every pixel to be perfect, a lot of them do anyway. And uh, now, you know, I was on a panel yesterday in Toronto with a guy from Google, and they're, they're worried about having screens in your fridge and your toaster and Google glasses and stuff. And all that's really doing is taking the, the acceptable quality level down. Yeah. So, with the big trends for the future, when it looks from entertainment and from arts point of view, it becomes context and personalization. What that means is if I'm watching something that maybe it's interactive, and it's going to, I mean, it's really scary that they're going to know exactly where you are and what you're looking at. And that's horrible for advertising, but just from an entertainment perspective, you can start to craft your storylines to include things about where that person might be. You can, you know, turn on their phone cam and take pictures of them and put them in the story. It's happening. It's really creepy. Um, you know, People are going to be walking into polls watching YouTube on Google Glass, but it's going to happen. It already but, has. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but I think the, the two keys to that is personalization and context. And if you can craft your story around that to fit the medium the best, that's really going to win. I have a question, actually, myself, really quickly. Um, it was on a similar topic. Uh, just I think that, um, and maybe you disagree, the reason why people slam the door in your face is that there is a... Uh, uh, there's this an attempt to hold on to legitimacy uh, on the part of the filmmakers of this is the way it's always been done. You know, if I have a film in a theater, that makes it a real film. And people, you know, starting with direct-to-DVD films have been very negative and um, uh, non-embracing of new media, even if that legitimately gets their content out there. So how do you think that uh, the system can change to make um, services like all of your platforms be legitimizing in the way that a theater seems to be legitimizing? Well, it, it depends on, on, I mean, that's a great question because what it comes down to is what your expectations are for your film and your expectations for yourself as a filmmaker. It is just a vastly different world financially than it was 10 or 15 years ago. It is really, really hard to make money. And, you know, when I was in high school, I had friends that were musicians that actually had a viable, you know, they could actually think maybe one day I'll be, you know, this will be my living. And it's so much harder to do that with film today, just like it is with, with music. And it's, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, in a lot of ways, there's lots more great voices in filmmaking being seen and being discovered. And so that's the, the positive. But what suffers on it is the financial. And so everything that all of, all of us are doing is trying to find ways to still make that happen, to make the movies seen, and to figure out a way to pay for them. Um, because it's tough. And one thing that filmmakers have to, should understand, I'm, I'm always a little surprised at how little I get contacted these days by filmmakers. When I first started out, I would have 50 movies across my desk every month, you know, and that was pre-digital video. Um, when I do get solicited now, they don't know who I am, or they're not me, but 
the company, and they have a very limited understanding of how distribution works. Because I think this, this, this goes to your question, you need to have an understanding of the space and how movies make money or how TV shows make money. Because even if your motivation is not to do so, you need to understand what everybody else's is. And one, one thing that I really disappoints me is you should be working with all of us together and it, or all of people like us together in some capacity. Because if you make a deal with me for theatrical and with Adam for your, for your direct, uh, from your site downloads and with Fandor, but we don't know about each other, our motivations are all gonna be different in, in how we think we, we're servicing your film and how we're gonna make money off of it. Rather than if you go in with a plan and say, I wanna do this with theatrical and I know how that plays into what happens online or what happens on DVD, then we can all work together and we can all mutually benefit and the movie's gonna be so much bigger. And so it's when those things happen and when those cooperative relationships are created that the movie is legitimized and you can achieve something. You're not gonna be Star Wars, but you'll achieve something that should achieve your goals you know, and gets a big audience for your film. I'm gonna add two quick points to that. Number one, understand that a lot of the direct-to-DVD products are engineered films. My favorite example is like the boxing movie that's half Spanish language. Someone made that to sell to a certain audience, and they've made a lot of money on that. The people who do the direct DVD, they go to the festivals, they shop for films, but the majority of their catalog is things that they finance and created for a market they know exists. And the second part about is, is theaters, I mean, it's always going to be something for, I'll say, my generation. I think you guys are a lot younger than I am, but we have the memory of going to the theaters growing up and having a great experience. And now, the new generation has that same experience on their couch watching a, a brand new release from iTunes, maybe. So it's changing slowly. Yeah. Um, and I'll just add quickly that, you know, it's, it's true. The theater experience is still there, but it isn't the only way to legitimize a film. I mean, the film could just be, you know, it's, uh, this is the opposite, opposite extreme, but, you know, a million hits on YouTube. That, that doesn't necessarily make it a film. Sometimes it's just a cat video that does that. But if you, I think the bigger importance is just providing access to these films. A lot of people, you know, uh, some purists may want to see it in the theater or only see it in the theater, but the vast majority of people just want to be able to see it. Um, it's, it's much more important to be able to do that. Now, I don't know if they'll want to watch it on their Google Glasses ever, if that's the only way to get it, but having it some way to get it, even if it's not in the ideal presentation. And on our side, just very quickly to add to that, on the theatrical side, the onus is also on us and on the movie theaters to try and make that experience in theater more exciting. So we try and eventize as many of our screens as we can and add music or speakers or whatever and to, to show what that differentiating factor is. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take the last Good question. Good afternoon. Thanks for this is kind of a very stimulating conversation. I have to imagine each of your business models uh, turns in large part on, or, or, or certainly values, your mining the data of your users as to what they're watching, how much of it, what they mm -hmm. want, and all that. For each of you, how important is your facilitating the interactivity of community around the content offering? One of the reasons I ask this, especially this directed to gather films, <laughs> big screen value proposition is essentially two things. A, a big screen, a better you know, experience than at least yet we have in our homes, but that may be changing soon. We may be able to disintermediate the theater on that pretty soon. But the second piece can be the gathering of community around the content, and that's especially valuable if it's performing arts content or if it's cause-related content. Is it important to you to be facilitating that, uh, that, that interactivity and community gathering? Yeah, and it, it definitely is. And we try and provide a whole lot of tools. And we actually have internal marketing that, we, that will support our films. And the reason for that is basically because I know how hard it is to get 50 people to show up to a movie theater. I've done it for 15 years. It's really hard. And so for somebody who that's not their job, that's not their career, we have to make it as easy as possible for them to reach out to their community, their friends, their 
there. And lastly, do you all believe in the uh, essential, uh, in, sh in having transparency of the data you're finding that's driving your business being shared with your content uh, providers? Because there are a lot of biggies out there, Netflixes, et cetera, that, that don't. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I think it's important to know is that if you have a million subscribers on YouTube or you do a million in sales on iTunes, you don't know where that came from. It's all blind. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure, I, I, with our service anyway, it, you get the name, you get the email address, you get the geographic data, you get the analytics behind each piece of media, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we don't really hold on to that for our own personal gain. It's more to pass back to the filmmakers. Or, I mean, we do a lot more than films, but, you know, back to the content holders. And that's just because that is, you, you know, when you look at any server, oh, not really, the, these guys have something special, but we are, we're going to commoditize. And, uh, you know, you have to look at a build versus buy. And what value can you give someone that, you, you know, if I build it, I can do this. And a lot of the reasons to build would be to get that data. So we just say, okay, just take it. It's really valuable. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thanks again. Um. Thank you.